Welcome again to the second day of the International Science and Research Symposium on cleaning, health, hygiene, uh, the public's good, and all of those connections. Uh, some people are still coming in day by day. I'm Steve Spivak of the University of Maryland, the chair of the Siri Science Advisory Council, and a 30-year consultant with, with the Restoration Industry Association. Um, if you cannot read from the back, which you can't, permit me to read for you. I've badged myself this morning, and the Siri color, a little bit for health, is green. So this button says, we take, we take science seriously, which we do. And having discussed the need and the importance for clean standards, especially with a preliminary focus on K through 12 schools, I have a second life, third life when I said my third career. Um, I'm the co-author of two probably of the largest books written in the English language on standards, standardization, certification, uh, conformity assessment. Um, that's, you know, American National Standards Institute, the ISO. I chaired an ISO International Standards Committee for five years. So this button from another of our meetings says, ask me about my standards. But I thought it was very appropriate given our focus on the Clean Standards and Clean Standards Science Committee. It's a, a pleasure to begin the program. Thank you all very much for your questions and your participation yesterday because that is equally important, if not more important, than the presentations per se. Our first speaker this morning is uh, Dr. T. Guidotti. Um, just before I do his brief introduction, I will tell you that when I first spoke with him uh, at George Washington University, I went and met with him in his office and was immediately impressed by his one both tremendous range of expertise and skills in a variety of different scientific areas, as well as his commitment and interest in cleaning for health. And one of our difficulties is where do you find the people who are the microbiologists or the public health people who really know or are interested in cleaning, which is our life and business. Cleaning, care, maintenance, facilities, care, and restoration. T. Guidotti is uh, an MD, he's a doctor, as well as Master of Public Health. Uh, he is the chair of the Department of Environmental and Occupational Health in the School of Public Health and Health Services at the George Washington University, which is not so far away in, uh, in Washington, D.C. And he is also the director of the Division of Occupational Medicine and Toxicology in the Department of Medicine in the School of Medicine at George Washington University. And if you recall my comment yesterday about the archives of environmental and occupational health, for those of you who are doing anything from cleanup of water spills to oil spills, <laughs> um, these are the science journals and this is a premier one. This International Archives, T. Guidotti is the senior editor. So I'm trying to give you an example of how broad his uh, range of reach and expertise. Join me customarily in welcoming T. Guidotti, please. I'd like to begin uh, by saying that I have been tremendously impressed by this conference and by the spirit of professionalism that has been demonstrated by Siri. Uh, I have learned many things at this conference. And one of the most important things I've learned is that I shouldn't let Dr. Dancer anywhere near my office. <laughs> Today I'm going to be uh, speaking of uh, uh, value-added services in the cleaning sector. And I'm hoping to present to you some, some elements for your consideration for an overall strategic plan of how the sector might begin to approach some of the issues of, uh, of standard setting, of validating the, uh, uh, and demonstrating the value added of the sector, of uh, engaging the scientific community, anticipating standards, and providing the information ahead of time so that those standards will, uh, will be directly relevant, uh, and essentially a way forward. So we will proceed here with uh, our discussion on elements for a strategic plan for research and development. 
uh, and I'm, uh, I'll start by sort of setting the, uh, the, uh, uh, the stage. I don't feel that cleaning services have been accorded the respect that they deserve. And I think that they have not received the respect accorded to professional services. They've been perceived as support services. They've been perceived as uh, the uh, uh, essentially uh, routine maintenance, background, uh, the sort of thing that keeps the, uh, uh, the motor humming without much thought as to, uh, as to how well that motor is functioning. And I think that's got to change. In the past, the cleaning sector has not had much opportunity to demonstrate value added, I think in part because a lot of it has been driven by price and uh, competition rather than demonstration of value added. I think that uh, uh, cleaning services have had to compete on other grounds and hey, whatever it takes in order to uh, stay in business. But I think that, uh, that uh, sexy logos and uh, giving services away and uh, coupons with deep discounts really don't project a sense of a professional service that is uh, uh, competing on value and on uh, uh, the quality of the services provided as opposed to, uh, to price. Now, I, I'll uh, hasten to say here <clears throat> that nothing I say that, that uh, and no uh, graphic that I've clipped regarding a particular company is meant as either endorsement or, for that matter, a pejorative statement about the company. The, uh, the current state of the industry is what it is, and I think that what we're discussing is a new way forward. So if a, uh, 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 if a company sees themselves here, and that's very unlikely because most of the uh, uh, clip, uh, graphics I've clipped are from uh, outside the United States, please don't get upset. I think we need to consider the big picture. And the big picture is not a single service that's not integrated into a large scheme of things. The big picture is in determining where the field of environmental health is going and where public health has its core interests and seeing how the, uh, uh, the cleaning sector fits into that and can be supportive of that mission for public health. Nice logo from the San Mateo County Health Department, which I think brings it all together very well. And that is to conceptualize health as being an outcome of the exposure and the, the dynamics in the built environment. We're accustomed when we think of environmental quality of thinking of the ambient environment, the environment out of doors. But increasingly public health has gotten the message that architects and uh, 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 building maintenance people got many, many years ago, and that is that most people spend most of their time indoors in an environment that they actually created themselves. Likewise, we invent cities, we build cities. So even outdoors, cities are part of the built environment. I think that what we need to do is think of the built environment as an ecosystem. And the question is, how can we function with minimal impact on that ecosystem? How can we prevent a spillover effect that damages the, uh, uh, the ambient environment um, through means such as, for example, persistent chemicals and, and avoiding that, uh, that problem? And how can we deal with public health where people actually live and most of the time they live in the built environment? So the big picture has many elements. Occupational health and safety and the safety of the workers who carry out this vital task is one of the, uh, the critically important considerations. So the, uh, the potential hazard presented by, uh, uh, by various agents, various devices has to be uh, uh, uppermost in our mind. The environmental impact this, I think, is, uh, is very much uppermost on your minds. The whole greening of the, uh, of the cleaning sector is a uh, huge and hugely encouraging uh, uh, movement. Product and service safety, which I think is, has been uh, uh, well emphasized in the past because manufacturers, of course, have to be concerned about liability. And that also means commercial product toxicity. The regulatory framework, as you heard uh, uh, yesterday, is a bit peculiar for disinfectants. And if you look, for example, at, uh, at the uh, reports on pesticide toxicity that come up from poison control centers, you'll see disinfectants coming up over and over again. That doesn't necessarily mean that they're, uh, that they're more toxic than anything else. What it means is that they're lumped together with chemicals in which they probably shouldn't belong. 
because they're used for a different purpose and they have different characteristics. But it's an example of how the regulatory framework has not really been well suited for disinfectants and for uh, cleaning supplies. It's really geared to other types of chemicals and disinfection products have been more or less of an afterthought. Um, I think that, I don't know if that's going to change, but I think that it needs to be a part of our thinking. Standard setting is, of course, huge. And if you set your own standards, then you can preempt somebody else having to do it for you. And you can set those standards in such a way that they work, that they're realistic, and that they demonstrate value added. And once that's done, you can compete on the standards, and you can demonstrate uh, uh, that you're hitting targets, as opposed to, uh, to guesswork. Again, it comes back to professionalism. It comes back to integrating into the big picture and being able to, to present accurately the cleaning sector as making a co positive contribution to the built environment as opposed to being a necessary cost to keep the built environment from getting bad. Psychologically, that's a big shift. You're, in one case, you're adding value. In the other, you're preventing deterioration. Which do you think is psychologically more attractive? Then, of course, there are the special environments. Schools are obvious, and schools, of course, are filthy. The uh, uh, kids are bringing in all kinds of things. Their, uh, their uh, uh, classroom exercises uh, add, uh, add other hazards. Uh, animals, uh, the home economics kitchen, et cetera, et cetera. I think we need to address this. We need to recognize that, uh, that many kids have uh, uh, special health issues, for example, asthma. And I think that, uh, that schools can be a lot cleaner um, that it basically is a question of budget, it's a question of um, availability of services, it's a question of standards. Hospitals are obvious, I won't say very much about hospitals, except to say that with the increasing emphasis in medicine on patient safety and the increasing um, utilization of checklists, for example, in the intensive care unit, in order to be sure that physicians and nurses don't make a mistake, I think it's only a matter of time before these same uh, checklists and these same performance standards are imposed on hospital administrators for uh, requirements to provide a safe environment. And I think that that will be very nice. I think it'll be extremely nice to see hospital administrators held accountable for a change. Uh, but I think that it's going to change the, uh, the way that we look at the hospital environment. Vulnerable populations. There are many people who uh, uh, may or may not uh, go outside very much who live in situations where they, uh, they are at risk uh, of infection. Uh, certainly people who are undergoing uh, chemotherapy for cancer may have a, uh, a uh, reduced uh, immunity. <laughs> Individuals who are on kidney dialysis, who are uh, susceptible to certain types of uh, infections, uh, individuals with HIV AIDS. There are many people out there who do have special needs who are at risk, particularly at certain parts, of, uh, certain times of their treatment to infection from the, uh, the environment. And then, of course, sustainability. And that has to do with, uh, with our projecting for the long term. How can we create a built environment that will last that will be environmentally sustainable, that will not compromise the health of people because if people get sick, they're not going to tolerate sustainability. They're going to insist on, uh, on a return to, uh, to a uh, safe and healthy environment and it won't, uh, environmental sustainability won't matter. So certain needs have to be met. Cultural sustainability, which I think is a critical and, and uh, very much overlooked element. People have expectations. If people expect that their environment will be clean, then they will insist on a higher level of service. If people don't care, then there won't be that same, uh, uh, that same uh, uh, drive to achieve a certain standard of, uh, of, uh, of cleanliness or, uh, or maintenance. So educating cultural awareness is important in maintaining sustainability, maintaining people's drive to, uh, to uh, spend the money and to uh, take the time to do it right. Uh, <clears throat> this slide is really more for me than for you because you live this and in a sense I'm a guest. Uh, I think that there are many dimensions of health in the cleaning sector that I've learned uh, as I've become more and more acquainted with it. 
Yesterday we heard a great deal about uh, microbial contamination, really focused very, very much on that uh, critically important issue. A lot of the discussion also had to do with reducing the risk of person-to-person -person transmission using the built environment as a medium, cleaning surfaces so that touch won't uh, transmit uh, 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 a pathogen from one person to another, uh, and so forth. But there are also other issues that uh, relate to health that, again, add value to a, uh, to a satisfactory cleaning service. One of them is allergens. And here, of course, mold is one of the, uh, the big four uh, of uh, allergens that people uh, uh, become sensitized to. Uh, dust mites, cockroach, and uh, uh, animal dander being the uh, uh, the other big three. But I think that the uh, there are, there are many people that I have seen in my practice who have demonstrated allergies to molds that are also undergoing amplification or growth uh, in their home environment. So these these cases I think point out that uh, you don't have to invoke any strange theories about uh, mycotoxins and, uh, and toxic mold in order to have a, uh, uh, a mold effect. The allergy issue is quite enough to demonstrate the, uh, uh, the health implications of uh, mold exposure. And then, of course, you have the problem of bioaerosols in general, bacteria, pollen, uh, mold spores, and so forth. They are irritating. They make people's eyes red, they give people a sore throat, uh, and so forth. So even if they don't kill you, they are very unpleasant. And uh, atmospheres in which suspended uh, airborne bioaerosols are present are uncomfortable atmospheres in our offices and in our homes. Then you've got chemical and dust exposure. Uh, many of my patients have asthma. Even those who don't have asthma but who have what we might consider in our mind lesser degrees of allergy, like hay fever, have a characteristic in common, and that is reactive airways. As you uh, go down the, uh, uh, the respiratory tree, the, uh, the bronchial tubes get smaller and smaller, but in that intermediate level between the, uh, uh, the trachea and the first division, and when you get out to the, to the far ends of the respiratory tree, there's muscle in there. And these muscles clamp down, constrict airways, and cause breathing difficulties. These can be triggered by many things. In an asthmatic, they're usually triggered by allergy. But they can also be triggered by irritating fumes, like uh, solvent vapors. They can be uh, uh, irritated by dust, even dust that, that is uh, relatively benign in terms of health consequences can provoke a reaction in the airways of an individual with, uh, uh, with these conditions. So low levels of bronchitis, triggering asthmatic events, discomfort as a, as a uh, result of provoking uh, airways reactivity, very, very common and very closely associated with, uh, uh, with uh, cleaning and with uh, uh, the, the state of cleanliness in the home. Of course, safety issues, uh, slippage, cleaning up spills on the floor and so forth are important, as well as visibility. It's hard to see a hazard if it's cluttered up with paper towels in the corner or if things are not, uh, not kept clean. Pest control, I think, is obvious. Uh, the, uh, uh, we're infested with, uh, uh, here in Washington especially, with uh, rats and cockroaches and mice and so forth. Some of these, uh, these uh, pests are vectors of disease. Uh, cockroaches, for example, are, carry a lot of salmonella. And uh, uh, we want to keep the food away from them. We want to keep places, uh, keep them from having places where they can nest, where they can hide. And another really critical aspect of uh, uh, the cleaning sector and health, I think that's been overlooked, is the psychological sense of safety. If you're in a dirty environment, you do not feel safe. You feel anxious. And I think that that mental health aspect has not been very much explored. Now, there are other dimensions as well. And uh, this whole issue of the visible uh, evidence of safety, looking and seeing that something appears to be clean, is also, as Dr. Dancer pointed out yesterday, an indication that somebody has cared enough to wipe the surface, to clean it, to, uh, to, uh, to polish it. And that means that the, the likelihood of there being contamination is 
demonstrably less. It's by no means a scientific standard, but it is an indication that something has been done that should have been done in, in terms of maintenance. So the, uh, the visible evidence that something is clean is, uh, uh, I think, incredibly important psychologically and as an indicator that uh, uh, somebody has done their job. Maintenance also prevents malfunctions uh, and uh, reduces safety hazards. <clears throat> I think that, uh, that um, again, the appearance, visibility of the hazard, and the perception of safety are more important than we've given it credit for. Maintenance helps to uh, reduce wear and erosion uh, and is extremely important in terms of control of corrosion. And you'll notice safety comes up here over and over and over again as an ongoing theme, in addition to the, uh, the health consequences, but also safety. It's also, by the way, good maintenance is also a signal that uh, uh, the owner of the building or the, uh, uh, whoever is uh, uh, letting the contract has adequate resources to keep something clean. One of the first signs if you walk into a bankrupt company that you look at is evidence of peeling paint to give you an idea of whether the, uh, the, uh, the owner is in economically uh, dire straits. Well, I suggest that we can put these things together in a different way. And I think that we can take this, this background to the cleaning sector, this notion of the built environment as a, an ecosystem in and of itself, and the drive to professionalism and concomitant with that uh, uh, setting scientifically grounded evidence-based standards, and really define a new era for the cleaning sector. And I think that uh, uh, here's one company in, the, uh, uh, in Britain that um, uh, has come to uh, the same conclusion so, uh, uh, and has put together a really nice logo that illustrates it. I think that in the past, cleaning has been viewed as a consumptive cost. It hasn't been considered as an investment. And in that regard, it's very similar to where I live, my core expertise, which is coming out of occupational health. Occupational health is also perceived by companies as a consumptive cost until relatively recently they haven't thought of it as an investment that has a return. In the case of occupational health, it's the health and productivity of the workers. In the case of the cleaning sector, it's the health of occupants. And I would submit we can make a case for increased productivity. Cleaning, I think, in the past has been a little regarded. And I think that the challenge now is to demonstrate this uh, value-added model. Uh, an evaluated added model that, uh, that documents the, uh, the utility of enhanced services, that uh, has objective standards for uh, uh, effectiveness so that it can be documented, that uh, sets standards according to evidence as opposed to uh, uh, whenever possible as opposed to consensus. Consensus is good when you don't have the evidence, but evidence trumps opinion anytime. Uh, Packages for specialized services uh, for critical environments. Uh, I mentioned a few of them a moment ago. And essentially putting it together so that there are integrated packages of services rather than one-offs and uh, 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 a very narrow product line. I think that this idea or this concept of a strategic direction aligns with the emerging public health interest in the built environment. The two are very complementary. They work together uh, very logically. I think that it connects to sustainability, environmental sustainability, as well as economic sustainability and social su sustainability. Social sustainability also assumes that the uh, sustainable uh, uh, process or mechanism or uh, arrangement is not going to interfere with people's health. Because if it does interfere with people's health, they will stop supporting sustainability in other ways, such as environmental sustainability. So their cultural expectations have to be met, their expectations for the protection of their own health have to be met, and then they will accept environmental sustainability. And if they accept environmental uh, sustainability as an underpinning, they will move toward business models and accept business models that eventually lead to economic sustainability. At least that's the way I put it together.